So I'm interested in allopolyploidy, which involves both interspecific hybridization between two divergent species, as well as whole genome duplication. So for example, here we have two diploid species, one purple, one green, and they cross together to form a tetraploid. And this tetraploid is going to have um, purple genomes and green genomes. And so each of these um, has genes on it, of course, and so uh, they're going to be homologues or the different progenitor copies from each of these two progenitor species. So for example, um, we would have a purple DFR from this purple genome and a green DFR from the green genome. And so we're interested in what do we see, which of these copies is actually expressed. So we could get homolog expression bias, where we have unequal expression of these two homologs from the different progenitors, and how does that affect um, the traits that we see in these polyploids. And so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to be reporting homolog expression bias as the percent of the maternal homolog that is expressed in the polyploids. So the questions that I'm interested in are how does genome merger through this hybridization yield novel and diverse phenotypes that we observe in allopolyploids? So for example, these four at the bottom are all Nicotiana tobaccum. These two at the top are their two progenitors, and so you can see that we have some differences in flower color. So how do we um, get those differences? We're also interested in how does the magnitude of homolog bias change? Does it increase as we see um, these polyploids um, as they increase in age? And do we see the changes in homolog bias are associated with the changes in flower color that we observe? So the study system that I use is Nicotiana, or tobacco, and it's a great system um, because about half of the species are polyploids. Today we're going to only focus on one of them, Nicotiana tobacco, um, and that was created from a cross between the maternal Nicotiana sylvestris progenitor and the paternal tomatosiformis progenitor to yield Nicotiana tobacco about 0.6 million years ago. So we have a few different accessions of this natural tobacco. You can see that they have differences in floral color. But we also have resynthesized allotetraploids that were made in the lab. So these are first generation allopolyploids. Um, we have different lines. And so we can get an idea of what's happening immediately following polyploidization and then compare that to what we see over 0.6 million years of allopolyploid evolution. So we use this to dive into this question of how does genome merger result in novel and diverse floral colors? So as you can see, the flowers that we're looking at tend to be different shades of pink. And so um, the pigments that are creating those flower colors are produced by the flavonoid biosynthetic pathway. So this is a branched pathway that has different pigments coming off of it. So we have um, anthocyanins down here at the bottom. We have pelargonidins that tend to be reddish. We have cyanidins that tend to be pink or magenta, and we have delphinidins that are blue and purple. And then up here, we have different flavanols. These are colorless to humans, but they absorb in the UV so they can provide signals for insects that have UV photoreceptors and can be important in pollination. And so we're going to see this pathway a lot. Um, all of these um, letters on, by the arrows are the structural genes that are making these pigments. And then we also have AN1 and AN2, which are transcription factors which regulate the pathway. So they're going to come up later. And so we know, based on previous work um, that I collaborated with Stacey Smith, um, that the differences that we see in flower color tend to be due to differences in the amount of cyanidin pigment that is produced. So you can see that when we have some of these darker flowers, we have higher concentrations of cyanidin compared to our white flower, which has none, and our light pink flowers that have less. But we wanted to get at the um, genetic basis of why we see these differences in pigments. And so we did a transcriptome analysis where we used um, flower material from our two diploid progenitors, two natural polyploids that have different flower colors, and two synthetic lines that also have different flower colors. And we used corolla tissue at three different developmental time points, one of which is early in development, middle development, and late development. And so all of the early development corollas did not show any pigmentation yet. But then as we look at our different accessions, we start to see pigment at different time points. And so that's why we chose these three. 
And so we did an Illumina um, experiment where we used um, single reads of 85 base pairs, and we used a de novo assembly approach. However, because we had really short reads, it was difficult to assemble and also very difficult to distinguish between these progenitor homologs, because even though they have diverged, they're still very similar. They're within the same genus, and so there's only a few base pair differences. So with the short reads, it was really hard to figure out, okay, which is the maternal um, homolog and which one is the paternal. And that is where our Oxford nanopore data come in. You recognize this guy? He's right there. <laughs> and he talked a little bit about this yesterday for you. Um, so we added long reads using Nanopore um, for our two progenitor transcriptomes at two of our developmental time points, the early one and the late one, um, because this will give us an idea of what's happening in those two um, progenitor genomes that make up tobacco, and so it's a good way for us to get an idea of what's going on. So in this experiment, we got about... Uh, 6.5 million reads, and um, the N50 read length was just under 1 kb. So, did it improve our assemblies? Yes, definitely. So, if we're looking up here in these first two rows, this is our assembly based only on that Illumina data. And so you can see that for um, the Sylvestris maternal and somatosiformis paternal progenitors, that um, we had high numbers of contigs, and our N50s were about 1.5 kb. When we added the nanopore data, and we also added um, available transcriptome data um, for these two progenitors, all of that together, we have um, decreased our contig number by about um, 11,000 contigs and increased our N50 length by about 800 base pairs. If we look at the BUSCO genes, you can see that with our illuminate only data, we have a whole lot of missing and fragmented genes, but in our new assembly with the nanopore data, it's much better. So. Excellent. So from this, we took our Sylvester's assembly and our Tomentosiformis assembly, and we put them together in silico to make a, to a tobaccum assembly, because tobaccum has these two progenitor genomes, and then we use that to do the rest of our analyses. So what did we find? Here, on our x-axis, we're going to have the different pairwise comparisons. So over here, we're comparing our two progenitors. Here we're comparing our tobaccums to um, our maternal progenitor, our tobaccums to our paternal progenitor, and then synthetic versus natural, natural versus natural, and synthetic versus synthetic. On our x-axis, we have the log fold change in, of um, the contigs within each of these comparisons. So if it is above the origin and a positive value, that means that those contigs were more highly expressed in Sylvestris compared to Tomatosiformis. And if it's down here in the negative side, it was um, more highly expressed in tomatosiformis compared to Sylvestris. And so, down here we have our um, uh, sample sizes for each of these comparisons for the differentially expressed genes. And what we really expect is that for the comparison between our progenitors, we should see that there's differential expression between most of those contigs, right? Because if you are giving a contig the opportunity to either map to its own genome or its um, other progenitor, it should map to its own. So most of the time that's happening, so we see a lot of differentially expressed genes within this comparison. When we start looking at our tobaccums to each of our progenitors, again, we expect that if we're comparing tobaccum to Sylvestris, that the tomentosiformis type homologs in tobaccum are going to be much more highly expressed than the Sylvestris, because Sylvestris doesn't have those. Potentially also, some of the Sylvestris homologs will be upregulated in tobacco compared to Sylvestris, and vice versa in tomentosiformis. And we see that we have fewer um, DEs in these comparisons than between our progenitors, but we still have quite a lot. But when we are looking at our um, comparisons within our allotetrapoids, then we're going to see far fewer, and that is what we see. We see more between our synthetic and our natural ones, which again makes sense because we have evolution between them. We have some in our naturals, but less than between our naturals and our synthetics, and then only a few in our synthetics. But it's still really cool, right? Because these are first-generation polyploid lines from the same parents, and we're still seeing that there are 177 dif differentially expressed contigs, which makes me really excited. We also wanted to look at what do we expect. So our, here we have our purple homologs from a Mars Sylvester's genome, and then our green ones from our Tomentosiformis genome. And so we would expect 
that we should see all purple up here and all green down here. We mostly see that, but there are a few that are misbehaving. So probably these contigs are mapping to the wrong genome, but there's only a few of them. When we look at our comparison between our polyploids and our progenitors, and we can look at both of them, we see that on the progenitor side, it's what we might expect, the sylv with sylv, tomf with tomf, but then some of those um, Sylvester and tomatosiform machines are being upregulated in these tobacco um, genomes. And then it's kind of a mismatch when we get to looking at what kind of differentially expressed genes are happening within um, comparing um, the allotetrapoids. And so sometimes contigs of either one are upregulated or downregulated across these comparisons. Okay. So that was kind of transcriptome-wide, but we are really interested in these anthocyanin genes, so let's dive into them. So within our new assembly, we can definitely distinguish the homologs between our anthocyanin genes. Um, most of them are in a single contig, and um, that includes the entire sequence um, of the coding sequence. And for the most part, progenitor homologs tend to map to the correct one. So in this table, we're looking at all of our anthocyanin genes. In this column, we have the percentage of the Sylvester reads that actually mapped to the tomatosiformis genome. And here we have the percentage of tomatosiformis genes that map to the Sylvester's genome. And for the most part, this is under 10%, except for this one, where we have 23% of the tomatosiformis genes map to the Sylvester's gene in the assembly instead. And so maybe for this gene, ANS, we're not as confident as what we think might be going on because things are not behaving as they should be. But for the most part, things look pretty good. So again, we have a similar sort of thing going on here, right? We have our comparisons along our x-axis and our log fold changes on our y. Um, the violin plots are representing all of the differentially expressed genes across the transcriptome, and the colorful dots are representing our anthocyanin genes. So the bold ones are the tomatosiformis homologs, and the transparent ones are the Sylvester's ones, and the color is similar to our little cheat sheet of our biosynthetic pathway just to orient you about what these are. So as we would expect in our Sylvester's to tomatosiformis um, comparisons, we have um, more highly expressed tomatosiformis homologs in tomatosiformis, and vice versa, Sylvester's and Sylvester's. When we compare our pink polyploids to our white Sylvester's parent, we see that we have increases not only in our tomatosiformis ones, like we would expect, but also some of the, uh, sorry, some of the sylvestris homologs are upregulated as well. But when we compare our pink polyploids to our pink progenitor, again, we see that the sylvestris homologs are upregulated, like we would expect, but sometimes um, tomatosiformis homologs are more highly expressed in tomatosiformis compared to the progenitors. But then the fun part is when we start looking at differences in our polyploids, especially differences between light polyploids and dark polyploids. And we can see that there's only a subset of these genes that are actually differentially expressed across these comparisons, um, especially the ones that tend to be um, going towards making the anthocyanins. We also wanted to look at does the magnitude of homolog expression bias increase with polyploid age. And so to look at this, we looked at the deviation from equal expression. So equal expression would be 50% of each, and then we're looking at the deviation from that. And so we have synthetic polyploids and natural polyploids, um, and I, um, our sample sizes here are across the transcriptome, looking at one-to-one -one homologs. Um, and so we do see that with the synthetic polyploids, we tend to have less deviation from equal than we do with our natural polyploids. The median is similar, but you can see that the interquartile range is much broader for our natural polyploids, and this is um, significantly different. So we do see that there's an increase in the deviation from equal um, in our natural polyploids compared to our synthetics. But if we look at the difference between our polyploids and our progenitor ratio, so what is the ratio of these homologs in our two parents, we don't see that there's any difference in deviation um, between our synthetics and our natural. Those look pretty similar. Our next question was, do the changes in homolog expression 
bias correlate with changes that we see in flower color. So we're going to be focusing just on a single gene, DFR, and that's the first gene that is leading towards anthocyanins. And we're going to look at early development and late development and the percent of the sylvestris expression. So this dotted line is our progenitor ratio. So it's very low, which means that we see that there's a higher expression in tomentosiformis compared to sylvestris. And um, our natural polyploids tend to be kind of closer to that progenitor ratio, whereas our synthetic ones are more around equal expression. But we don't see that there's differences um, compared to the changes in flower color, right? Because we're tending to see differences between natural versus synthetic as opposed to between our dark pink versus our light pink. And this is early on in development. We see similar patterns in our later development. So we don't. We don't really see that the changes in homolog bias are correlated with changes in um, flower color. But if we look at the overall expression of these genes, so adding our two homolog together, we do see that we can see some correlation with flower color. So especially in early development, so our sylvestris parent, which is white and doesn't produce any cyanidins, has very low DFR expression. And it's actually at similar levels to what we see in our two light pink polyploids, whereas all of the darker pink ones have higher expression earlier on in development. But if we look later in development, they kind of catch up. So it seems to be that at this early stage, if we don't have very much expression of this DFR, which is going to be driving the pathway towards making anthocyanins, we might be yielding this light pink floral phenotype. So we can also look at whether we see common differentially expressed genes in similar comparisons. When we, when we compare light pink to dark pink polyploids, do we tend to see that the same things are differentially expressed? And so these, have you seen these kinds of plots before? It's kind of like a Venn diagram, but I think easier to read. So here in our first column, we can say that we, all of these comparisons have this gene. In this column, these two comparisons have that gene. So all of them share a higher expression of the tomentosiformis DFR in the darker pink flower, which makes sense. Where we have um, two comparisons that are similar, we can see that some of them are um, higher expressed in the um, darker pink flowers, some are more highly expressed in the light pink flowers, and this one, TAN2, seems to be more highly expressed in uh, sorry, the synthetics than the naturals, so that's not necessarily correlated with the flower color. And then we have a couple that are just um, singletons where we are only seeing those differentially expressed in one of these comparisons. But I've highlighted where those fall in the pathway, all of these genes that are differentially expressed between light pink and dark pink flowers. And what we can see is that those are pretty clustered toward the ends of the pathway. So the genes that are making either anthocyanins or flavanols, or sometimes the regulatory genes that are um, regulating this pathway. So to conclude, um, nanopore data definitely improves the quality of our assemblies. So we have about um, 11,000 fewer contigs, and we've increased our N50 by about 800 base pairs. We see that synthetic polyploids tend um, to show significantly less deviation from an equal homeolog expression, which suggests that homeolog bias does increase with allopolyploid age. We don't see a significant difference between the deviation um, of our polyploids to our progenitor ratios in our synthetic versus our natural. And we don't see that the homolog, changes in homeolog bias correlate with changes in flower color. However, we do see that overall expression is correlated with flower color changes because we have higher expression of DFR earlier on in development in our dark pink flowers than we do in our light pink flowers. So I would like to thank all of the people I've collaborated with to do this work across very varying portions of my career. Um, but I'm most excited to show you this because this is the first picture of the McCarthy Lab. So these are two undergrads that I've started working with um, this semester, and so we're going to be taking this forward. And so I was excited to... We took this picture yesterday. All right. So I'll take any questions if you have them. Do 
me overall. So I don't know that yet. Um, and that's something that Lainey, who's over here in the glasses, is going to be helping me work on. So we're doing a project in collaboration with one of the um, math people um, at SUNY Cortland um, to basically say, OK, well, here we have this pathway. And we have our pigments. And we know what the expression is of these genes. How does this evolve to give us these things? And so Stacy actually just published a paper where they've done a whole model um, modeling, um, optimi optimizing blue flower colors. And so I think what our plan is is to kind of use that model to say, OK, well, we know that we see this combination of pigments and these polyploids. If we do those simulations, does it actually reflect what we see in our transcriptomes? So I'm, I'm excited to get there. Because it could be differences of what is actually entering the pathway. But I think it also has to do with how the pathway, the flux of the pathway is going. So if we, so there, um, FLS and DFR are acting on the same substrates. And so they're in competition with each other. And so potentially going towards one is in detriment towards the other. So I think there's a lot of dynamics going on there. That answer your question? OK. Anybody else? Go ahead. Um, Anyway, okay. uh, we can go back if you want. Uh, you, uh, so the, the reference transcriptome that you're using for the polyploid is kind of concatenated version of the two. Yes. So when you're, when you're mapping the synthetic and the natural to it, do you have to include like a correction? I mean, it's only 26 million years, I guess, but. I mean, the sort of big synthetic reference that you made in silico, those progenitors are not the progenitors in the subgenome of the natural. Correct. So, I mean, the synthetic and natural, like those, you might expect that those reads wouldn't. Right. So, because it's only 0.6 million years, there are only a few differences between the Sylvester's genome within the natural tobaccos and the Sylvester's genome that we used. Um, but that is, we're also wanting to do this in an older polyploid section within the genus, and then it's going to become much more of a problem, right? Because we have not only divergence between the progenitors, we have divergence between the progenitor genomes within the polyploids and the diploid progenitor that we're using. And so that's going to be much more complicated. For this data, it's similar enough. There's going to be a few mismatches, but far fewer than what we see between Sylvester's and Tomatosiformis. If you have any ideas about how to combat that, I would love to hear that. It doesn't have to be now. <laughs> Anybody else have any other questions? A few. Yeah, and that's. So that's another thing that I would love to um, go forward with is, especially in these genes um, and enzymes, really, that are um, the FLS and DFR that are com competing for the same substrates. Do we see differences in enzyme affinities? Um, and so I have a collaborator in the, um, or potential collaborator in our chemistry department who's also interested in this sort of thing. So hopefully, this will be down the line. But yeah. Um, and then figuring out, okay, so yes, we have expression differences, but are there actual enzyme differences?